So two things before I start. So first, uh, I'm not going to do the things on connected and quantifiers that Serge was so excited about. <laughs> <laughs> because I had too much materials already, so sorry about that. Uh, second, second thing, you know, as you heard, I, I work in an economics department, and I don't know if you know that, but economists, they interrupt talks all the time, on every slide. So I came to expect and enjoy interruptions. So I'm telling you that to the students here, this is a lecture for you, so make the most of it by interrupting me and throwing in your thoughts and questions, okay? So, uh, you already heard a lot about uh, uncertainty. The fact that when we reason, we can attach to propositions a degree of confidence, a degree of probability that it's true or that it will become true. But I want to explore something a bit different with you this morning. I want to explore another dimension of propositions that is not their probability, but their utility. Their utility, and by utility I mean, well, the degree to which we wish they were true. The degree to which we want them to be true or to become true. So let me take a few examples, because probability and utility are really orthogonal. They don't really depend on each other. So let me, uh, oops, <laughs> I could actually start the talk. All uh, uh, right. All right, so let me take a few examples of that. So we have here uh, the probability axis that goes from zero, I'm sure this is not going to happen, to one, I'm sure this is going to happen. And then you have the utility axis that goes from minus a lot, I really don't want this to happen, to plus a lot, I really want this to happen. Going for zero, I really don't care if it happens or not. So here, I'm being attacked by a shark. This is something that has a very small probability. I don't think that's going to happen in my life, really. But I really don't want it to happen, also. Very, very negative utility. Of course, there are things that are very rare, but that I would like to become true. So here I'm winning the lottery. You know, very improbable, but that would be really nice. Here, I'm winning the Nobel Prize. As you can see, I, li I would like that even better than winning the lottery. And because I'm not that modest, I think the probability of getting the Nobel Prize is higher for me than winning the lottery. Don't laugh, that's true. <laughs> I mean, I'm a scientist, it's a good start. <laughs> All right? Okay. So not everything is so extreme in terms of utility. There are things that, you know, have moderate utility. So this is, the, pro the proposition here is that I'm going to have green beans while I'm in Montreal. And the probability is sizable, I think. But I'm not going to enjoy that very much. I'm not really fond of green beans. What I'm fond of is beer. And the probability that I will get a beer in Montreal is, uh, well, after last night, it's already won. So. <laughs> okay, right? All right. So, once we start thinking about proposition in terms of the probability and utility, we can start thinking of ways to combine probability, utility, and behavior, and the kind of mental activity that they reflect. So, let's go. Here, this person here, is, is processing these inputs, which are the probabilities and utility of some propositions, and the output of this process is a behavior. Okay, probability, utility, behavior. So what is that person doing when looking at the probability and utility of various propositions and outputting a behavior out of that process? Well, that person is making a decision. Right. That's the basic model. That person is looking at what he could do, thinking of the probability of what's going to happen, if he does this or that, the utility of this outcome, and then trying to pick the best action to take in order to bring the most desirable outcomes. So that is called making a decision. So here, that person is taking as the input his own, his own, his own behavior, the things he did or does, the utility of these things, and the output of that process is a probability. That's more subtle. Okay, so let's take an example. I'm a smoker. Smoking has the potential for some very bad utility. You know, lung cancer, stuff like that. So I smoke, and I really don't want to get lung cancer. 
So what I'm doing is thinking, hey, you know, what are the odds of lung cancer? Not that probable anyway. So what I'm doing here is wishful thinking. I'm revising the probability that something will happen based on the fact that I'm doing something that has a very bad utility. So I smoke, I won't let, get lung cancer, so I sort of convince myself that the probability of getting lung cancer is actually very low. So is here, this, yeah. Is this really probability? I mean, they have to sum up to one and all the laws of probability have to be fulfilled? No, it's the graph confidence. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, sir, are you a student in that summer school or a colleague of mine? <laughs> All right. So that's one zero for faculty members. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry. No, you don't have to be sorry, but guys, you know, <laughs> try to compete. Okay. All right. So yeah, no, degrees of confidence, whatever measure of certainty you want, but no, it's not full blown probability. All right, and here, What's going on here is even weirder. So I'm doing some, yeah. Um, I, I thought at first when you said probability and utility are, are trouble, I thought by probability you mean something like objective chance or something like that. Yeah. But then I understand it's like degree of credence. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I, I'm using probability as an easy term, really, <laughs> for, to, to avoid thinking, saying very cumbersome things like, you know, <laughs> some function that, you know, has some relations that are close to probability, but not necessarily all the functions of probability. But that, your question is, uh, is based on what, it, what was your point about uh, probability and utility not being orthogonal? Because I understand that you are orthogonal if I think that probability is objective chance, whereas where it's degree of credence, then it depends on the subject, and then utility also depends on the subject, so. Yeah, they, do, but they both depend on the subject, but, but, but uh, they both depend on the subjects, but they don't have to be influenced by each other. But the source is the same, right? The source is the same, but then again, uh, okay, so I smoke and I don't like green beans. The source of these preferences is the same, but can I say that there is a dependency between my smoking and my liking green beans? That's orthogonal in that sense. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, here, uh, that person is uh, looking at his behavior. Well, I'm, I'm saying his because I think that's a man, right? So that person is looking at his behavior, uh, the probability of what's going to happen given that behavior, and then changing its utility function. Okay, so I want you to lose too much time when you're trying to think what's going on here. So again, I'm going to take the smoking example. I'm a smoker. And I've been looking hard at the probability tables of various diseases linked to smoking. So I, I can't really change that. I really believe in the probability tables. So what I'm going to do now is to think, okay, I could think, oh, why? I don't care much about lung cancer. I'm fine with lung cancer, but that's not that plausible. So what I'm gonna do is change my utility function and say, well, there are benefits to smoking too, right? You know, I really derive pleasure from it. It's a good opportunity to network with other smokers during smoking breaks. And you know, I've heard that actually smokers get Alzheimer's disease less. <laughs> you know, so I'm gonna get, you know, I'm gonna try to compensate. So, so basically that, that's what social psychologists used to call cognitive dissonance, really. When you have this state where you have to justify what you're doing by whatever means possible. All right. So uh, the jury's out about whether you should call these things reasoning. Well, seriously, this is probably not reasoning. This is really decision making. No, this is this reasoning, is this reasoning. Well, I'm not sure that you want to call that reasoning. I'm not sure people would agree. But so let's turn to examples that are actually reasoning proper. So here, the, the person doing the reasoning is here. And what this person is doing is taking as an input what he knows about, for example, the probability, the, the beliefs, the probabilistic beliefs and the utility function of that person in order to predict the behavior of that person. So basically here I'm reasoning about the mental state of that person to predict that person's behavior. And things can get complicated because that, that person's behavior might affect his utility function but also that person here, she may have preferences over what that person is gonna do. 
maybe the actions of that person, they impact other people too. So I have to take into account, well, what the preferences of that person, the preferences of that person, the beliefs of that person to try to understand what, what that person is going to do. And that can get quite complicated. And this is what I'm going to look at in the rest of the talk, okay? Because that guy here uh, is doing the thing about connectives and quantifiers that I'm not going to address in the talk, okay? So now, the question is, for the rest of the talk, how do we do that? How do we take into account what we think other people want and believe in order to predict their behavior? And even in, in cases where a single individual's behavior has consequences for other individuals. As you can see, uh, that can get pretty subtle. Well, as you, as you will see, <laughs> that can get pretty subtle. So let's take, to start, the 10,000 feet view. And I'm going to introduce two, three very general perspectives on how people do that. So the first perspective is best you know, encapsulated in Daniel Dennett's uh, intentional stance. That's the rationality principle. So here, the perspective is that when people try to predict the behavior of other people, they think, okay, I'm going to assume that other people are perfectly rational. That's, by the way, the standard economics model. When you want to predict the behavior of people, you make the hypothesis that these persons are optimally rational, that they update their beliefs in a Bayesian manner, that they, have, that they combine that with utility functions that are well-formed, and that they do this expected utility calculus that will help them decide what action has the best, best chance of bringing the best outcome for them. And they do that selfishly. Okay? They only care about what's going to happen to them. So in this perspective, agents are utility maximizers. They maximize their own expected utility. That is, they maximize the achievement of their own goals. And everyone assumes everyone to behave like that. Right? In, in this perspective, everyone in the room here believes every other person to be a perfect selfish utility maximizer. So this is not a psychological theory, right? This is just a, a philosophical perspective for Dennett or a working model for economists. But nobody claims that this is really what happens. But the idea is more that things happen as if people were doing that in their mind. Okay, so please remember these two points. Here, everybody is a selfish utility maximizer and everybody believes everyone else to be the same. Okay, so now we're going to lift one of these postulates. And we're going to look at social psychology now. And social psychologists have proposed this norm of self-interest. So the perspective here is that people believe others to be utility maximizer, even though they don't consider themselves utility maximizers, or even though they don't themselves maximize, selfishly maximize utility. But they still think that other people do that. It's even stronger than that in a way, in this perspective, because in this perspective, people believe each other, people believe others are utility maximizers and they believe they should be, that this is a social norm. So, okay, so here we are, we've relaxed one constraint. People are, not, people are not typically thought to, people are not typically utility maximizers, but they still believe everyone else to be. No. Let's relax another constraint. And let's look at behavioral economics. Now, behavioral economics shows a double departure from the rationality principle. Here, people, not only people are not considered to be selfish utility maximizers, but they also believe that all the peoples are not utility maximizers. So let me get a few examples of that. So because the evidence for that mostly can, comes from economics game. So let's look at a very simple game, the dictator game. So can you raise hand if you know what the dictator game is? 
Okay, well, let me explain. You cannot get simpler than that game. So you come to the lab, and the experimenter tells you, okay, here you go, $10. I'm giving that to you. And this is another person who takes part to the experiment. Do you want to share the $10 with that person? You can keep everything if you want. You can give one, you can give two, you do whatever you want. Okay? And let's make that even more interesting. That other person is in, is, an, is in another room, never saw you, never will know who you are, neither do you know who that person are, and it is perfectly anonymous. So do you want to keep the $10 or do you want to share that with this other unknown person? And, well, the rationality principle here would say, well, what are you going to do, right? Keep the $10. Of course you are. I mean, why would you share with someone you've never seen that don't know who you are, okay? No, you take the money and go. And that's what the basic economics model would say, but what, what happened is that actually people, most of people share. So it seems that people are not well, selfish utility maximizers in the sense that they would maximize their profit. So that's the dictator game. Uh, that's, or if you will, that's, yeah, that's the sunny side. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, of course, if you're an economist, the game is to change the utility function so that people maximize something. And, and as you say, you can make the utility function more complicated by saying, okay, so uh, making some friend, managing reputation, of course, the fact that it's all perfectly anonymous makes that strange, that people would want to make friends or manage their reputation while the other person has not seen them, that essentially the, even the experimenter doesn't know the decision. Right? Though you're right in general, and that's how you're, you're going to explain these things in real life. But in the lab, in the anonymity condition, it's hard to explain what's going on. Except that you have to have a utility function when you have second order utility based on what happens to other people. That is that you care about what happens to other people to some extent, in, 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 to some degree compared to, the, to, the, to, 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 to how you care about what happens to you. Yeah, it, it's very hard to falsify the rationality principle if it's formulated in such a way that utility, utility can be defined in any way you want. In that case, yeah, everything's <laughs> game. Uh, sir? Wait, slower, louder? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a very valid concern. Perhaps I'm thinking that the experiment tells me the other person is not seeing me and will not know me. Yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you sure about that? Am I being lied here? I'm being deceived. And this is the exact reason why deception is forbidden in economics experiments. And it, it's forbidden in economics to, to lie to your subject or deceive them, not because, I mean, economists are so ethical that they never lie, but because they are worried about contaminating the subject pool. That if you start deceiving your subject, then you do experiments and people don't believe you. And then your results are worth nothing. So that's the big battle between psychologists and economists. Because psychologists love to deceive their subjects. Right? But at the same time, they're contaminating their subject pool because when people hear it's a, it's a psychological experiment, they say, oh, sure, okay, so what it is supposed to be about? <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, I've seen that sometimes, you know, the subject pool is shared between psychologists and economists in some universities. And I've seen that once, there is a big sign on the door saying, today is an economics experiment. You're not being lied to. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so uh, do I have the time to just say, okay, so let's say this is the study side of, uh, of how people care about other people pay off, the generous side. You know, I share the money because I care about the fact that this other person should get money too. But there is a negative side, which is spite or envy. 
to this way I care about the payoffs of others. So let me quickly give you the ultimatum game. Raise of hands, do you know the ultimatum game? Okay, explain. All right, so in the ultimatum game, you get to the lab and you're given $10. And the rule is slightly more complicated than in the dictator game. You must make an offer to the other player. You must make, make, an off, make an offer that is, we're going to share the money, this is how I keep, this is how you get. And now that person can accept the offer and you get away with the money as shared, or that person may, must, can reject the offer. And in each case, the experimenter takes back the money and you both get zero. Okay? Now, this is a subtle game because, hey, uh, who would share equally, like 5-5 five, five or 6-4? Can you raise? Who would offer like 5-5 five, five or 6-4? Who would offer 1? Yeah, because if you're a rational player and you believe other people are rational, you offer 1 or 1 cent. Okay, because hey, take the perspective of the second player. You have a choice between taking whatever is given to you or nothing. So if you're rational, you take the money, whatever money it is. So if, if you are in the first position as the first player, you offer the least possible amount you can. But what happens in this experiment is that when you offer less than one third, when you, are, when you start offering two dollars, then most people reject. Most people say, okay, fine, you want to play that? <laughs> then we get zero. And there is no second round, it's not a negotiation. No, the second player is just burning the money out of spite. And that is the nasty side of how we care about the pay of, of others. Sometimes we're generous and we, we try to equalize the earnings. And sometimes we burn all the money because we have less than the other guy. So we care about the payoffs of others and uh, we assume that other cares too. Because of course, this is what happened when you're the ultimatum proposer. Most people in the ultimatum game actually realize what's going on and they make an offer that is 5-5 five, five or 6-4. That's the model offer. That's the most frequent offer, 5-5 five, five or 6-4, no less. Because people know that what's going to happen if they, if they actually uh, make too, uh, too small an offer. So we know that other people, we, we care about the pay of, of other people and we know that they, and we know that they know exactly, right? And everybody knows that we do. Uh, and there's the trust game, but I think uh, I, I'm going to run out of time if I explain to you all the economics game in the world. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Trust game is a lot of fun too. Uh, all right. So, so we have these different perspectives on how people do this. Do they, uh, are they, do they really assume that everybody else is selfish? Do they think everybody else should be selfish? Or do they understand that people are not always selfish, but in which condition? So lots of complications here. And this is where we can start doing reasoning research. Because reasoning research can tell us things about this problem. We can use reading study to get relevant data about how people predict other people will make decisions. That is, we're going to simply have reasoning tasks where we ask them to predict the behavior of other people based on the information we give them about these other people. So this is not true of all reasoning tasks, of course. And of course, it's not true of reasoning tasks that use non-valued content for their proposition. So for example, okay, let's say if there is an apple in the box, there is a poster on the wall. And no, I'm telling you there is no poster on the wall. Response A, there is an apple in the box. Response B, there is no apple in the box. Response C, who cares? <laughs> All right. So in that case, we're using contents for a reasoning task that essentially nobody valued. So of course, this is going to be useless if we want to predict how people you know, reason about preferences. But we can use contents that includes propositions that are valued to one or several agents. So for example, so. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with that, but let's, go, let's look at some examples. We can use conditionals that describe actions and consequences. Right? So the conditionals describe some actions and the consequences of these actions for various agents. So if I let you go away with this, my boss will fire me. So when you hear a conditional like that, I'm sure you're making immediate inferences about what's going to happen. Is the speaker here is going, is the speaker going to let 
the listener go away with whatever the listener is doing? Of course not, right? What the speaker is doing here is apologizing for, for not doing something, right? If I do this, I know you want me to do that for you, but something bad is going to happen to me. So I'm not doing it, okay? So we use this kind of conditionals and we can make inferences about oh, what these people want and how they're going to behave. This one is, of course, much easier. If you testify against me, you'll have an accident. <laughs> an accident, <laughs> right? We know what's going on here, right? And we can have some degree of confidence that there will be no testimony here, okay? By the way, by all, uh, by all classification rules that linguists have or pragmatic, uh, pragmatic linguistic has, this will be classified as a, a warning, not a threat, a warning, right? Because, you know, it's just an accident. Things happen. Bad stuff happened to people. Just warning you, not a threat. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. But, I mean, these are not examples for reasoning. These are examples for understanding natural language, for understanding semantics and pragmatics, right? Well, that, that's, the, that's the point. That is, if you want to say that this is not reasoning, well, <laughs> you know, uh, fair enough. <laughs> but I think, and I'm, I suppose I will say a few things about that, I think if you do like the, the things like this, you're cutting reasoning research from a whole range of application, from a whole, from a whole set range of domain that it can actually contribute to. You can use the method of reasoning to do this kind of thing. If you want to say this is not reasoning, then you're leaving all this domain of application to other people. Right? But if you want to claim that territory for reasoning research, where there's nothing to prevent you to do it. And yeah, I've got a first examples here. So if he helps her, she will yob in. Okay. Is yobbing something pleasant or not? Yeah, come on. Yobbing must be nice, right? Yobbing is a reward for help. All right, so we'll see about that. We'll see what happens when we give people tasks like that, when we replace some verbs by nonsensical uh, verbs, and we can see how people immediately, you know, get an understanding of the value of this word, of this action for several people based on the structure of the situation. Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, what I'm giving you here is a long list of what I call folk actions, which are, you know, heuristic rules that people seem to apply when they're predicting the behavior of other people. So if time allows, I'm going to go through all of them. But let me reassure you, I will, uh, my plan is just to give you like a one slide introduction to each of these principles. So, no need to read that now. Okay, let's look at this. Self-interested behavior, so remember, self-interested behavior is just the basic heuristic rule that you're gonna do what gives you positive utility. When I wanna predict your behavior, my first, my first default rule is to think you're gonna do what's good for them. You're gonna do what's good for you, right? So we can give simple examples. We can tell, okay, look at that. If Tom buys a new suit, he can't pay the rent. Well, when people look at that, okay, so if Tom does that, something bad will happen to Tom, so probably he's not going to do it. And so they predict that Tom is not going to buy a new suit. Uh, you, can, you can use forms where you, for example, you manipulate the degree to which the event is negative or positive. So if Tom buys a new suit, he can't eat out. So this is negative, probably, but certainly not as negative that not being able to pay the rent. So you give that sentence to people and they tell you, yeah, I think he's not going to buy a new suit, but I'm not so sure. It's not as clear cut because I don't know about his utility function and maybe he doesn't care about that, maybe he cares, I'm not sure. And this one is just a sort of parallel to a roof uh, suppression effect that Serge summarized in his introduction, but using utility. So let's say if Tom goes to the party, he'll buy a new suit. 
And if Tom buys a new suit, he can't pay the rent. So this is reasoning, by the way, right? And no Tom goes to the party. So if you're doing logical reasoning here, you say, okay, Tom, I know that Tom goes to the party. So, and I know that if he goes to the party, he'll buy a new suit, so, he, so he's gonna do that. I know if he buys a new suit, he can't pay the rent, so he won't be able to pay rent. So from this, logically speaking, you should actually conclude logically that Tom is going to buy a new suit and, and will not be able to pay the rent. But that's not what people say. When you give that problem to people, they don't respond logically. They tell you, well, he's not going to buy a new suit because, you know, probably he doesn't want that to happen. So this is a situation here where the way we reason about other people's preferences takes precedence to the way we reason logically. Here you have a clear case of conflict between, between the logical conclusion of the argument and what we know about the, how, the way other people make their decision and where there is a conflict between these two things, the decision aspect, you know, is stronger than the logical aspect. Okay, so this was a very simple situation where you have one agent, one utility function, and you just say, okay, that person is going to be what is best for that person. Oops. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, okay, so this is just a variant. You remember in the norm of self-interesting? No. Uh, okay, no, that, sorry, that's something different. Uh, so this is about people thinking that all the people should do what's best for them. Okay, so let's say uh, you have a decision to make and depending on what decision you make, something good or bad is going to happen to me, well, you know, I think you should do what's good for me. Let's not just dwell on this one, and let's, okay, let's look at the entry contradiction. So this is, this was done, this was pretty done by uh, David Arbor uh, and co-authors. So here, we're looking at this norm of self-interest thing. You remember the norm of self-interest says that people think other people should do what's good for them. It's not only that I think you're going to do what's best for you, I think you should do it. That it's a social norm that you should pursue your self-interest. And so David and co-authors did a lot of interesting reasoning tasks looking at the boundary conditions for that social norm, that people should pursue their self-interest. So here, for example, you have the basic example. If Robert uses this oil, his recipe will taste better. Okay, who's Martin here? <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> so so his, his full name is Robert Martin. <laughs> okay. so, so if that guy uses the oil out here, the recipe will taste better. And interestingly, people, when they, when they look at that, they say, yes, he must use the oil. Not only he will, but he should, he must, you know. Like for his social obligation to make your recipe taste better. I, I'm, I'm always surprised by that, but the results are very robust and compare a lot of different models, like is going to, will, should. And really, people seem to think there is an obligation here. He should do it. Uh, of course, there are lots of boundary conditions for that. For example, if Daisy work on the early technique, David, what's the early technique? <laughs> I mean, is that, is that an acting technique? I, I got that example from the paper, but I don't know what it is. So if Daisy works on this technique, she'll perform better, and people say, well, she must work on the technique then. But if you said that if she could also do breathing exercises, they think, oh, 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 in that case, I'm not sure about what is for her the most efficient way to achieve the outcome. And if I have doubts about what is the most efficient way, I don't think she has an obligation to do any one of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, of course, too, uh, so this is a dis basic disabler. If Vanessa takes her visit card, she'll buy more. I'm so sorry, when, it's, when I pick example from other people's paper, <laughs> <laughs> I just, my, my brain is just buzzing at the moment. What, what's, the, what's the point? Buying more is good. Okay, let's, let's go. Okay, other example. 
If Paul goes to this reser reservation, I think, he'll have a nicer vacation. Okay, so clear example. Oh, is, is, this is going to uh, help him have a better vacation? Well, he must do it. But if you say, oh, there's not only positive consequences, right? There are also negative consequences like increasing risk of cholera. People say, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> In that case, he's, not, he's got no obligation to do it. <laughs> which, is, which is nice, right? <laughs> okay, so if you, if you include also negative consequences, then the norm of self-interest tells you that, okay, there's no longer any obligation to pursue your self-interest if actually it will also increase the risk of a negative outcome. And uh, <laughs> this one I like. If Lucy wears this dress, she'll be offered a better job. Okay, she must wear the dress. So by the way, the dress was produced by exploited children. <laughs> okay. Yes, David. Is that proper reasoning? Yes, I'm, I'm just saying, just support you. Yeah, of course. You're basically. Yeah, we're not bringing something very exotic. We're just going from indicative to to, to the ontic, right? And but, and but of course the transition is what interesting in the, the transition from indicative reasoning to the antic reasoning here. Well, what you call rightly the antic introduction. So uh, so okay. So in that case, people will say, okay, she, okay, yeah, okay. If the dress was produced by exploited children, then she has no obligation to wear the dress, even though it will bring a better outcome for them. So that's that's cool. She 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 doesn't have to do. The question is, will she? You know, if, you, if, you're tell, if you're told these things about Lucy, that you, you know nothing about Lucy. You just know that if she wears the dress, she'll get a better job, and she knows that the dress was produced by exploited children. Is she going to wear the dress or not? That's, I don't know, actually. I don't know anything about Lucy, right? Maybe she doesn't care. Maybe she's all about career. You know, and she's not a very ethical person. And so that's hard. So now we, we're switching to the question of what happens when someone could do something that has good consequences for that person, but which also inflict what economics would, economists would call negative externalities to other person. So negative externality is a fancy term to say that you're doing something that's bad for another person. So, so we have this person, she can do something that's good for her, but there will also be negative externalities for other people. So how is that going to, to, to work? What is that person going to do? Well, in that case, it seems that people at least ap apply a principle of limited altruism. What I call limited altruism is that when you know that someone can do something that's good for another person, you think that the action will be taken as long as there is no personal cost. So if you ask me something that's good for you, you may assume that if it doesn't cost me anything to do it, I'm going to do it. That's limited altruism. Right? You can do something good for other people if it comes at no cost for you. And the other way around, the other, the other side of limited altruism is that I think you will refrain from hurting other people if you have nothing to gain, at least. That, you know, that's kind of minimal ethics. I think at least you're not hurting people for fun. Right? That, that you need a reason to do that. And so a funny thing I did once was to generate random statements random conditional statements in which some people could help or hurt other people and see if limited altruism predicted what people would say. So, so these are weird statements because again, they are gen randomly generated. So one of the statements was this, if I do this, you will hurt yourself. Weird statement, right? If I do this, you will hurt yourself. But then people, what people do is to think, okay, so this is negative for the listener, 
And doing this, I don't know what that is. So I don't know if the speaker has something to win or to lose by that. So I'm going to assume this is neutral for the speaker. And so limited altruism tells me that the speaker is going to refrain from doing this neutral thing because it will hurt another person. I know this is weird, but I like these examples because it shows you that this limited altruism principle can do very well in predicting what people, the inference that people make about other people's behavior, even when they are faced with statements that you have, you know, uh, uh, that you don't usually hear in daily life. That sounds like coercion. If I do this, you will hurt yourself? Yeah. How, how, because, how? If you're, because if you're threatened by the person who hurts themselves, that I'm going to hurt myself if you do this because the person doesn't want them to do it. How could I coerce you into hurting yourself? No. If I say that. The person who threatens to hurt themselves maybe informs, informs the speaker that they will hurt themselves. It's not there that anybody is threatening to hurt themselves here. I'm just saying that if I, you know, okay, if, 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 if I click here, you will hurt yourself. Right, I mean, there's no information, but you can sort of read into it. Yeah, well, that's right. So, so, True, it, 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 and I'm going to come to that. How people are really into these scenarios to make sense of them. And you, sir, have a very fertile imagination. <laughs> because I'm not sure I understand your scenario. But okay, let's see how people fill the gaps, yes, and try to make sense of all this. So, oh, okay. So this one is, uh, okay, this one is easy. If Marie does this, and this is neutral for everyone, we don't know what it is, Alan will help me. Again, this sounds like a soap opera to me. If Mary does this, Alan will help me. Do, do, do. <laughs> so people read that and they say, okay, uh, this is positive for the speaker. And it seems that Mary, it, it costs nothing to Mary to bring about this positive outcome for the speaker. So limited altruism is, predicts that Mary is going to do it. Yeah. I think, I think people assume that. People assume that, and I think this is why they say that. That Mary is aware of the positive externality of this action for another person. And then you have the weird cases. If Sally helps me, I will hurt you. Can you make sense of that? If Sally helps me, I will hurt you. Something weird is going on, right? Oh, you think you're, you're looking for an excuse to fight? <laughs> I, I think it will be successful in doing that and having Sally help you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Another suggestion? <laughs> oh, you think it's something like... Well, it's, it's, it would be a very indirect way to say that, right? That I need to hurt you because that's a condition for Sally to help me. I think it would be more direct to say, if I hurt you, Sally will help me. And, and that, I think, would be quite clear, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, dude. <laughs> but, yeah. well, what if Sally's partner um, gets jealous, so it's like an emotional hurting. So if Sally helps me, I will hurt you because you'll find out. Because you will, because you will then be violent with me, and I can take you, so I will hurt you. Well. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Either that or just emotional. You'll find out that Sally helped me and you won't like that. So nice, hurts. nice, nice. Are you, are you not fascinated by the human mind? By the way, we can construct all these stories <laughs> from a simple sentence. This super complicated story about the violent partner of Sally. <laughs> I, think this is, I think this is amazing. And, and, and I think this is reasoning. And this is, it is reasoning at its best. I, th I think this is why we reason. I think this is why reasoning evolved. To actually make sense of the network of cooperation and antagonism between human species. And that when we see something like that, our brain just goes into you know, automatic mode. Okay, I need to make sense of that. I need to invent a social situation where this makes sense. Uh, last one is, if you hurt me, I will help Lewis.
Well, this is hard, right? But this one is hard because it's actually, it's a, it's a kind of Necker cube. So I want, I, want, I want to spend a bit more time on that and thinking about social contract because this is what's going on here. This looks like a weird social contract, a promise to do something if you do something. And people are really, really puzzled about that and they give very different responses because they seem to reach very different interpretation of what's going on. So, uh, wait, no, right. So if you hurt me, I will help Louis. It's kind of a necker cube, this conditional. Because you, you, people seem to hesitate between is that a good for good proposition or bad for bad proposition? So is it bad for bad? That is, is it a threat? That if you hurt me, I will, I will help Louis, which is your arch enemy. So this is one possibility, you know? Okay, so this is bad for bad. So I'm, uh, this is clearly bad. So I think this must be a threat. But some people actually have the opposite reading. If you hurt me, I will help you. Huh? So you want to hurt me now? I want to be hurt. So I make you a promise that if you hurt me, I will go, I will go and help your friend Lewis. I see some smiles here. Some people got that reading. <laughs> so, so we were interested in that kind of automatic completion, these kind of templates that people have, that they read things in terms of threat of promises, that they need to have a proper structure, a proper social contract, and that if the sentence is ambiguous, they will try to make sense of it by putting it in the mold of the social contract, the good for good or bad for bad proposition. So we try things like, well, let's do, for example, simple completion. We tell you, if Louis, if Louis hurts Jesse, just fill out that sentence. What's going to happen? And here, of course, people go for the bat for bat template. And they say, well, if Louis hurt Jesse, they go for symmetry. Jesse will hurt Louis. Or if Louis hurt Jesse, Jesse will take revenge. Ne we never see something like, if Louis hurts Jesse, Jesse will be happy. Or, or Jesse will reward Louis. Sounds trivial, but it's not that trivial that you immediately go for the social contract, the good for good, the bad for bad template. And then we try the non-verbs. Okay, if Louis tempts Jesse, then Jesse will yob Louis. Usually I try to use gender neutral pronouns in this example, because you know, experience told me that when I give this talk and there is a male and female agent, at some point everybody is giggling <laughs> and trying to imagine what yobbing and tempting must be. So, trying to use gender neutral pronoun, but yeah, Louis is still here. So, okay, so if Louis tempts Jesse, then Jesse will your Louis. Okay, so I have no idea what this means. But no, I tell you, Louis dislikes to be yorbed. Okay, so Jesse yorbing Louis is something that Louis doesn't want. Okay, so what about tempting? Is that something Jesse likes or not? No, right? Because we go for the bat, bat for bat template. Because here this sounds like a punishment for Lewis. And if there is a punishment, then it means that this was bad for Lewis. For Jesse, sorry. But no, the funny part is this one. We say if Lewis hurts Jesse, then Jesse will zim Lewis. And the default interpretation here is that zimming is bad. Okay? because it seems that it's a revenge for being hurt. But no, I tell you, hey, you know what, Louis likes to be zimmed. Louis likes to be zimmed. Louis is fond of zimming. And in that case, the thing people do is to say, okay, well, in that case, I mean, Jesse likes to be hurt. I can see no any, no, I, I cannot see any other explanation. Because the good for good friend late is so strong that here, it, it, it leads people to reinterpret hurt as a positive thing in that context. Uh, I've got four minutes, right? So this, I'm going to tell you, okay, take our message here. Uh, well, no, you will never know. Okay, so, uh, 
so I, I'm going to summarize quickly. So, so, so I'm, I, I'll try to go through what we know about our folk theory of decision. That is, the way we reason about how the, other people make the decision and uh, what drives other people's behavior. And I've shown you uh, the basic and introductory evidence for a series of folk actions, that is, heuristics you we use to predict the behaviors of others. And I just want to make two final points. And one point is, is what I'm offering here an extension or restriction of the psychology of reasoning? Because in a way, I'm arguing that this is an extension because now we're putting, we're giving uh, their proper role to preferences and utility. And we can explore large new territories that were not usually uh, 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 the kind of territory that the psychology of reasoning would explore. But the problem is that at the same time, I'm restricting you know, the breadth of reasoning research because no, because I, 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 I'm studying utility and preferences, I'm limited to studying agents with a mind. Because, you, because it makes no sense to reason about the preferences of agents without a mind, of the preferences of nature. But I'm, I'm, I think that this is an acceptable restriction given, uh, given the advantages of, of uh, well, studying all these things I, I've showed you so far. And even if you say that now we're restricted to studying agents with a mind, well, the thing is that mind attribution, well, whether you, you, you realize it or not, you attribute a mind to many, many uh, agents other than humans. But okay, I don't want to get into that. So I'm just going to conclude by saying that I've shown you one thing today, which is how we reason about preferences to predict the behavior of others, but reasoning about preferences is certainly not limited to predicting the behavior of others. And other domains that you can explore with that is risk communication, uh, inferences about the moral character of uh, various agents, uh, reasoning about how agents self-deceive themselves, seeing through the positive illusions of others, and you can even actually uh, say something interesting about how democracy works, but that will be for another talk, I think. Thank you.